My name is Roger. I'm from Minnesota, and I'm a retired forest ranger, having spent the better part of three decades working for the U.S. Forest Service Law Enforcement and Investigations Division. Since my retirement, I've had plenty of time on my hands, and over the past few months, I spent a lot of that time listening to various anthologies that you've published. I think it's awesome that you publish the stories of regular folks like me. So, with that in mind, I think I have a story that you might be interested in. It seems a little strange that I'm so excited to tell you about this, as it's not exactly the kind of thing most people want to hear. I used to wonder how you get so many people wanting to share the bad memories with you. But after having thought about it for a while, I think I figured it out. These aren't the kind of things that we can talk about around the dinner table in polite company, and I've never had a single person ask me in the flesh, what was the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? People don't want to know. At least not the kind of people I've ever associated with. But at the same time, these are things that, for whatever reason, we want to share with people. And much like your channel's viewers, I'm pretty apt to lend my ear to a story that's a little darker. So, without further rambling on, this is the story of one of the truly terrifying moments in my time as a forest ranger. For the vast majority of my career, I was posted in the Voyagers National Park up near the Canadian border. Since the park is split in two by a series of lakes, it's popular with fishermen and kayakers. But these lakes are also populated by many small islands, many of which are popular camping spots. People come up to the VNP to get away from the city and get some private privacy, and it doesn't get much more private than your own personal island, does it? Well, one afternoon, I got a call from a chief ranger asking me to do him a little favor. He had gotten a call from the International Falls Police Department, a small border city about 20 miles to the west. After an officer over there had received a missing persons report, some lady's husband had gone on a camping trip with an old friend and had failed to return after being due back that morning. My job was to head over to their regular camping spot on a place called Wolf Island to see if they'd moved on or not. The ranger team at VNP is probably one of the most amphibious in the country and definitely the most waterborne in the region. Half of our job consists of policing the waterways and making sure all fishing and boating are within regulation. So, not only do we have ready access to kayaks and motorboats, but we're very comfortable operating them. So, when I got the call, I headed to the Ash River Visitor Center, which was where we docked our boats. But then, just as I'm prepping the boat to sail over to Wolf Island, I get a second call from the chief. The IFPD had reached out with an update, one I needed to be informed of immediately. According to the chief, this wasn't just a case of two fishermen having overslept after too many Miller lights. The missing man's son had been in touch, and this time, it was to warn law enforcement that not only was his father most likely armed, but had been acting extremely erratically prior to departing for the camping trip. This is not what I had been hoping to hear when I heard that there was an update, but I was more than equipped to deal with the situation. Seeing as I was on the law enforcement side of things as opposed to working solely at the visitor center, I had pretty much all the same options as your average police officer. But that didn't mean that I wasn't feeling a sense of apprehension regarding what I might run up against. Nine times out of ten, incidents in the park are resolved quickly and peacefully, but as you can probably guess, it's the one in ten that keep you up at night. So, after prepping the boat, I sailed west for around 20 to 25 minutes until I spotted Wolf Island. 
After using my binoculars to observe the island from a safe distance, I could make out a slight plume of smoke coming from its eastern side. I could have really done with some kind of bullhorn to call out to the missing camper. But I didn't have the good sense to bring one. So, I was forced to bring my boat right up to within about 20 or 30 feet of the shore before calling out, using nothing but my lung power. I called out once and then twice. And after the third call received no response, I decided to make landfall in order to get a visual on the campfire, which presumably had been started by our missing camper. I brought the boat up a little closer, hopped overboard, then waded my way ashore, calling out to our missing camper all the while. I could smell the campfire by that point, along with whatever was cooking on it, so I was doubtless within earshot of whoever had been tending to it. But since no one called back and since I didn't see anyone as I walked up the beach, I figured whoever had made camp had moved on. Yet as I walked further onto the island in search of the source of the smoke, something caught my eye. For as long as I live, I'll remember this in photographic detail. It runs in my head on its own sometimes, like someone press play on a remote control in my brain. I saw something falling out of the corner of my eye, and when I looked, I saw it was a raven landing to join some of its brothers and sisters. But then I saw what it was landing on. There was a man sitting in a camping chair, not quite upright, but not all the way slouched either, with a big old hole in the upper rear portion of his skull. One of the ravens was pushing its beak into the hole, while a few others fought over whatever had leaked onto the ground. The body accounted for one of our missing campers. But I didn't have to wait long to find the second. Lying motionless next to the campfire was what remained of the second missing camper. Someone had made the effort to cut off his legs, I'm guessing after he was deceased and had worked on cutting them into small sections before placing them onto the fire. What had been smelling on the way in hadn't been the camper's late lunch, it had been a section of the second camper's leg sizzling away on the dying embers. I guess the guy in the chair hadn't the art to finish disposing of his camping buddy and had decided to let nature take its course on both of them. We never did find out why it happened, but we did figure out how. The killer had invited his friend on a camping trip to their regular spot. He hadn't hidden anything from his wife or anyone else for that matter. Which led us to believe that his decision to kill his camping buddy was either a spontaneous one or that he had planned to simply kill him before taking his own life as a way of avoiding any consequences. He obviously wanted to conceal what he'd done, at least at one point we believe he had. But then, this is where another argument for the spontaneous murder theory comes into play. Personally, I don't believe that he'd taken the time to research just how arduous the disposal of a dead body can be. There was no accelerant at the scene, so I don't think he'd planned to burn his friend's body. And when it became obvious that it was going to take way longer than he thought and that law enforcement might well come looking for him or his dead friend before the disposal could be completed, I think he decided to just check out then and there. There was a somber mood among the park staff for a while after that. As far as I knew, nothing like that had ever happened before, and nothing like that happened again for the remainder of my career. As you can probably guess, national parks aren't exactly high crime areas, and at the VNP, the most intense things generally get is catching up to a speeding boating party so you can tell them to slow down. So, to have something so terrible happen right under our noses, it had a real strong effect on our mood during the weeks that followed. Sometimes I think about what happened in that guy's head to make him want to murder one of his best friends. Like I said, we didn't hear about any affairs or betrayals or anything else that might cause a man to temporarily go crazy. 
It's all just one big mystery. And like so many other of life's mysteries, I think I'm a lot more comfortable living in blissful ignorance. I've been working in the film industry now for about 10 years. What I do specifically isn't what you would call glamorous, but it's still awesome to be part of the industry. In a nutshell, I basically scout locations for films and make sure the location is suitable for specific scenes. A lot of my peers in this industry got their start by falling in love with movies at an early age. For me, it was a very early age. My grandfather was a producer back in the 1960s. He worked with legendary talents such as Audrey Hepburn, Alfred Hitchcock, John Wayne, and even Elvis Presley. When I was really young, he would entertain my brother and me as well as all of our cousins. With wild and engaging stories about this myth-like Hollywood world from this time period. When I got a little older, I noticed that my grandma would almost sigh and look uncomfortable when my grandpa talked about his time in the business. When my grandpa died years later when we were adults, me and my brother had talked about some of the stories he told us and recalled my grandma's weird behavior. We threw around some ideas. But sadly, we arrived at the idea that during that period, my grandpa must have had an affair in Hollywood or something. It just made sense the way my grandma would basically transform into another person every time grandpa brought up Hollywood. It seemed to unearth unpleasant memories. And though it's not fair to assume it was an affair or something, we just think back to that time period in Hollywood, and let's be honest. It was like the wild west of partying, beautiful actresses everywhere, my grandfather being this hotshot producer, it unfortunately just made sense, as horrible as it is to think about. So why am I writing this story? Last month, me and my brother finally asked my grandma what happened while he was in Hollywood. We didn't want to hear fairy tale stories that my grandpa would share anymore, we wanted to know the truth. Especially since I started working in the industry myself. Just in case it had been an affair, we approached the subject very delicately with my grandma. We didn't want to upset her or bring up horrible memories, after all, until the day he died. My grandmother always showed so much love and admiration for my grandpa. So, it just seemed weird that he would ever do something like that. My brother, being the smooth talker of the two of US, asked point blank, why did Grandpa leave Hollywood? And why do you always go quiet and leave the room every time Grandpa would tell us stories? My grandma took this long, deep breath, and she responded, I suppose you're old enough to hear the story now. And then she began telling us this long story, like only old folks can. We could not have been more wrong, and I'm going to do my best to tell the story without leaving anything out. My grandma couldn't remember the exact year. But at some point during his run as a producer, he decided to move my grandma to Hollywood a detail that I never knew. When she was in her early 20s, she was an aspiring actress, and she was beautiful. Grandpa used his connections to get her some auditions and a chance to meet some of the big players in town. Grandma didn't want anything handed to her, though, so she used a different last name and never used my grandpa's name in an audition. She wanted to get a part based solely on her talent and not because she was married to the producer of the film, an aspect I greatly appreciated. After several failed auditions, she was almost ready to move on from her dream and try her hand at modeling, since she had some offers. She went on one last audition for a supposedly big film opportunity. And she told us that Grandpa was skeptical of this audition because he had never heard of the director or the film. But my grandma was being stubborn and told him to trust her, 
that she knew what she was doing. On the way to the audition, she got lost and found a rundown building way on the outskirts of town. I guess she was so new to the area that she didn't question the location at all. She thought that maybe this location was a creative choice by the director and maybe he had an office in the building. She walked in the door and inside were four individuals, three women and one man. All four of them were wearing masks and as soon as my grandma tried to make a run for it, two of the women grabbed my grandmother and started to beat her. After a few minutes, they tied her up in a chair. One of the women told her that if she wanted to survive, she was going to have to do something for them. If she refused, things weren't going to end well. So Grandma agreed, hoping that she could find a way out of the situation somehow. The woman continued to explain to my grandma that she was going to rob an apartment for them. The four monsters in the room told her that they would be outside the building and if she tried to call for help or run, they would know and they would find her and catch her. The woman explained all the details of the robbery to my grandma and she played along for a moment, realizing that this may be her only chance to survive. She assumed that once she was inside the apartment that she could find a phone or even better, the person would be home and she could explain what was happening. They arrived at the apartment building and my grandma's plan went out the window. The man in the group accompanied my grandma into the building and followed her down the hall. He was carrying some type of pipe in his hand and she had the sick feeling that the pipe was for her. The door was unlocked and they went inside. They gave my grandma a cloth sack and told her to fill it with cash. They assured her that there would be cash on a table inside the room, and sure enough, they were correct. My grandma started to slowly put the cash into the bag as she tried to think of a way out. The man shoved her and told her to hurry up. When she was filling up the bag, she noticed a vase on the table with some flowers in it. She grabbed the glass face, smashed it on the man's face, and ran out of the apartment. While the man fell to the ground, she noticed it was a back entrance to the building and sprinted out that back door. She ran several blocks and then found a cop car parked in the lot, and she frantically approached the police and told them everything. Cops had a little less sense of urgency towards women back then and it took them a minute to actually believe my grandma and take her statement. They eventually called my grandpa, and he decided to raise hell. Thankfully, my grandmother was able to give a very detailed description of her captors, which led to the arrest of one of the women, but the other three people were never caught. She never found out whose apartment it was, but she assumed it belonged to someone in the dark underworld of Hollywood at the time. The woman they arrested admitted the plan was to knock out my grandmother inside the apartment after she filled the bag and basically pinned the entire thing on her. They didn't plan on her escaping or having a powerful husband. They assumed that she was some young actress in Hollywood and getting caught at the scene of the crime would just make her another poor soul getting lost in the dark world of show business. This nightmare scarred my grandma so much that she didn't want to spend another second in that town. She moved back to her parents' house, and my grandpa followed several months later, and that's when they started their family. He would tell us fun and happy stories to entertain his kids, but whenever he mentioned his time in Hollywood, grandma couldn't help but think about the nightmares she'd endured. I can't imagine what my grandma was thinking during that ordeal, and I'm just so happy that she was able to get out of it and find a little bit of justice. As for the three other monsters from that night, I just hope they got caught for something else, and justice was eventually served.
In all my years as a private investigator, there was only one job that I truly regret taking. In my experience, private eyes are a pretty unscrupulous bunch. As long as the job doesn't entail overtly breaking the law, you can expect that they'll get it done for the right fee. And even then, I've known one or two that didn't mind bending the rules if it meant getting their pay packet just a little bit faster. They don't care if their findings get someone sacked or ruin their marriage or any of the other things that can happen when a harsh truth comes to light. All that matters is getting paid. I can't say I conducted myself much differently during the second phase of my investigative career, the first being bound by the rules and regulations of the Metropolitan Police. But I was definitely pickier than most concerning which jobs I did and didn't take. A good example would be the heartbroken mother who paid me on three separate occasions to find evidence of her son's drug use. The fourth time she asked me, I refused to take her money just to come to the same old conclusions. She needed to spend her money on an addiction counselor, not another detective for hire. Aside from that, I was okay with almost anything that kept the checks rolling in. But then came the day when I discovered where my line was and something I've never forgotten. One day, I got a call from a gentleman who asked if I was free for a job. I asked him for a brief description of what he wanted me to do, and he told me the following, ever since his wife had passed away, his 19-year-old daughter had been suffering from some increasingly severe mental health problems. As a result, she'd fallen in with a bad crowd. By bad crowd, I thought that they meant some kind of people who went out drinking, smoking some hashish, and generally just making a nuisance of themselves. The man then confirmed that his daughter had been drinking and using drugs. That wasn't strictly the issue, though. The issue was that she'd run away to join what he described as a cult. His daughter had been in a terribly vulnerable state following the death of her mother, and the gentleman who called blamed himself for not being able to provide the right support due to his own grief-induced depression. The result was his daughter seeking paternal support elsewhere, and as it happened, she'd thrown her lot in with a group that was actively exploiting her for their own gain. I essentially cut him off at that point, as I'd already made up my mind to take the job. I then invited him down to my office to give me a more detailed rundown of the situation while providing me with any recent photographs of his missing daughter. The man who arrived at my office the next morning was about as unremarkable as you can imagine, mid-forties, graying hair, fleece jacket, average as can be. But when you got to look at his face, I mean really looked him in the eyes. It was almost like he could see how the grief and stress had been eating away at him. At least that's what I thought it was at the time. He provided me with some photos of his daughter in her younger years. But then he showed me some more recent photos, and the difference was night and day. She looked incredibly unhealthy, with big dark circles under her eyes. The picture had been taken from social media, so she was posing and smiling in it. But you could tell how much she was suffering just from how pale and frail she looked. The man's daughter was posing with a friend of hers, but when I asked, her father said that she wasn't part of the suspected cult and that he'd be happy to put me in touch with her. The girls had been friends ever since they were children but his daughter had become increasingly withdrawn from her regular social circle prior to her disappearance. This meant that although she wanted to help, the friend had no idea where the man's daughter might have gone, only who she might have left with. The girl showed me a fairly recent group photograph that had been taken at some kind of party. Not everyone was facing the camera, in the background was a boy that the missing girl had apparently been dating in the run-up to her disappearance. 
Her father had asserted that the boy was part of whatever cult she joined and had, in fact, been the one to convert or induct her. The girl's friend said that she wasn't aware of any cult but admitted that the boy had a lot of dark interests and had once boasted of an extensive collection of books related to serial killers and other such crimes against humanity. He also seemed very possessive and protective of the missing girl, something that struck the girl's friend as what she referred to as a red flag. Since her disappearance, the man's daughter appeared to have purged her social media presence. But her new boyfriend had not. And since he was classified as an open register on the local electoral roll, I was able to get a hold of his last known address with relative ease. Now, this isn't strictly how I got his address. But I'd rather not incriminate myself publicly, thanks. I then found myself at a small, rundown council estate, one that was made up almost entirely of what were, at the time, newly built flats. You can always get into these places by just buzzing every buzzer. Someone's always expecting a pizza or a visitor or something, and even if they're not, they'll buzz you in out of sheer curiosity. I suppose that's why all of these things have got cameras now and can only let so many burglars in before the technology is forced to advance. Anyway, I got up to this guy's flat, knocked on the door, and was there banging away for a good few minutes before a neighbor came out and told me that the occupant had moved on. I asked the neighbor if she had any idea where, but she didn't. She told me that she barely spoke to the boy. And then one day, all the stuff was in bin bags or boxes, and he and the girl had been loading them into a van. I then showed her a picture of the man's daughter, and she confirmed that it was the same girl who had helped her neighbor move out. Anyone else might think that the trail had gone cold, but since I had his name and since I knew the lad was claiming benefits, it was once again relatively easy to get a hold of his new address. I simply called up the local job seekers. Told them that I was a potential employer, but that I needed his address for a background check, and Bob's your mother's brother. I knew where he lay his head again. Misrepresenting yourself like that isn't strictly legal. At least not when it comes to obtaining what's referred to as protected data, so trust me when I say it's not something I make a habit of. But like I said earlier, I felt absolutely heartbroken for this guy and his missing daughter. And I say that as the father of daughters myself. Every family goes through hard times, and every parent makes mistakes. But the guy had lost his wife, and he was about to lose his daughter. If I could put myself in the way of that, it'd be worth more than the pay at the end of the job. So I bent the rules a bit and I found this lad's address. I did a few days worth of surveillance on his block of flats, but I didn't see the missing daughter either enter or exit the building. I also followed the boyfriend around town for quite a bit, keeping an eye on who he met with, places he went, and stuff like that. But as far as I could tell, he wasn't meeting with the missing daughter. He also didn't seem to be attending any kind of cult meetings either. He visited a local pub, did his shopping in a local supermarket, occasionally went drinking with friends in the city center, but otherwise kept himself out of trouble. It reached the point where not only was this potential boyfriend obviously not part of any cult, but he might also be concerned for the missing girl and might even be interested in helping find her. The only other perspective scenario was that the missing daughter had stayed in this lad's flat for days on end without leaving, and as far as I could tell, he was only buying enough food for one person. But again, appearances can be deceptive. He could have just as easily been keeping the real prisoner, maybe feeding her very little, all part of some deranged course of brainwashing to induct her into the cult. I know it might sound a bit dramatic, but trust me, 
I've heard of much worse things, even seen a few with my own eyes too. And part of the reason I regret this case so much is that I broke the private investigator's golden rule. You never, ever engage with a target or anyone they're associated with that isn't privy to the investigation. People aren't stupid, and if they're on the run, they can be extra paranoid. Seeing a stranger hanging about, let alone one that asks questions or seems a bit too interested in them, can cause them to flee the area before you've ever had a chance to report them. And that's what this job consisted of. It was a location game. You return to the client with not just one address, but several. Detailing where their missing person is, where they spent their time outside of the residence, things like that. Getting all that info takes time, and if you burn yourself, as some people call it, you have to start from scratch instead of just getting paid. It's like being meters away from the finish line at the end of a marathon, then watching it move another 20-something miles ahead of you. I hate to over-explain the point, but I need you to understand that in approaching the lad I had believed was the missing girl's boyfriend, I knew I was taking an unorthodox approach. But at the same time, I believed that I was facing an unorthodox situation, so I made the mistake of believing my methods had to match. I approached the boyfriend at the bar of the pub he liked to frequent, hoping a few pints might loosen his lips. He turned down my offer of a beer or two. Then when I approached him a second time just after the pub closed, he became downright aggressive when I brought up the prospect of him having some female company at home. I didn't ask in a crude or disrespectful way. It was something along the lines of, you have a wife or girlfriend that's going to be angry you stayed out for a few drinks. He said no, then when I probed a little more, he became extremely aggressive and accused me of one or two things I'd rather not repeat. My first thought was he was causing a scene to deter me from asking any further questions which only renewed my suspicions that he was keeping the girl captive. This resulted in me casing his place for a few more days, brainstorming ways to look inside his flat. But then one night, the entire case climaxed with what was one of the most horrifying evenings of my entire life. I was parked opposite the boyfriend's block of flats, not immediately outside of it, but still in a position where I could see everyone going in and out. A taxi pulled up outside. So I grabbed my binoculars to get a look at whoever was getting out or getting in. Went out from the block of flat steps a person I'd never seen before. I've been keeping track of anyone and everyone who walked in or out of that front door. Working out who lived there, who was just visiting, what time certain people departed or arrived home from work. So when I saw this brand new person, all of a sudden, it caught my attention in a big way. I didn't get a look at their face. Thanks to the dark oversized hoodie that they were wearing, but I was almost 100% certain that, physically speaking, they matched the description of my missing female. She gets into the waiting taxi, I rushed to get in position to follow. Then I tailed the cab all the way into the town center, where the girl gets out. I overtook the stationary taxi, making sure to get a good look at the person who got out. And when I saw her face, I recognized her immediately. It was the missing girl. The person I'd been hunting for for the better part of a month. It's always a massive adrenaline rush when you finally make that big find, so I was in a cackling good mood after that. Having no clue at all what was about to happen just a few minutes later. I had to keep driving for a bit before I could turn around to head back, but when I saw her walking up the pavement towards me, I pulled over to the side of the road on the opposite side to her, got out of my car, then crossed the road to intercept her. All I did was offer her help and tell her that her father missed her very much. She froze, 
looked me in the eye, and asked me if that's who'd sent me, her father. I mean, when I said yes, she turned, waited for just a few seconds, then threw herself under the wheels of a passing car. The sound it made as it drove over her is something that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I stood there in shock for what felt like a very long time, staring at a girl that had been alive and talking just moments before but was now twisted up. Barely recognizable, and almost certainly deceased. I think I took my phone out and dialed 999 almost subconsciously because when I heard the operator's voice in my ear, it's like it brought me out of the deep days. The ambulance crews arrived as quickly as they could, but from what I could tell, there was nothing they could do for the poor girl, except cart her off to the coroner. She was gone. There was no bringing her back. As much as I could have let the police do their job, I took it upon myself to deliver the bad news to her father. I'm not sure what I was thinking. And this last part only adds to the deep sense of regret that I feel regarding what is undoubtedly the worst case I've ever dealt with. But it wasn't the act of telling him that I truly regret it was seeing his reaction. I called the girl's father and insisted that we meet in person as soon as possible. A few hours later, I was knocking on his door. With his home being situated in a well-to-do borough of London, he invited me into his sitting room. I asked him to sit down, and when he did so, I delivered the bad news as delicately as possible. In my experience, people react to the news that a loved one has died in a variety of different ways. But without a doubt, the worst reactions come from parents who find out that they've lost a child. It's a pain I can barely even imagine. But when I told my client that his daughter had been in an accident of her own creation and that she was most likely deceased, he barely batted an eyelid. I could tell that he was trying to conceal his emotions. But if those emotions were grief, it was unlike any type of grief I'd ever seen before. If I'm being honest, it looked a lot more like relief or satisfaction than shock or grief. And to this day, I'm very haunted by it. I think I was too shaken up at the time to really think about what I was seeing. Despite my many years in policing and PI work, I'd only ever seen one person killed before that night, and it wasn't anywhere near as brutal or shocking a fashion. So it's safe to say that I wasn't in my usual frame of mind when I delivered that news. I apologized for being the bearer of this bad news, told him that I wasn't expecting any kind of payment. But before I left, he said to me, thank you, and by God, he meant it. He was glad that she was dead, and I know that now. And the weapon he'd used to kill her was me. It was only the next morning, once my head had properly cleared, that I realized what exactly it was that I'd done. I hadn't been rescuing a girl from a cult, there was no cult. I think a deeply abusive father had hired me, or more accurately, tricked me into tracking down his daughter who'd made a very courageous bid to escape him. Then when she realized that he'd never just let her go, she decided to take her own life rather than face the prospect of seeing him again. Now I know what she might be thinking, and trust me, I've asked myself the same question many times. Why not just move on somewhere else? Why opt for taking your own life instead of continuing to evade him? I don't have a straight answer for that myself. I think I could investigate for 20 years and still never really know what happened in that family. The father would never willingly talk about it. And the only two witnesses were buried next to each other, having taken their secrets to their graves. I'd like to tell you that I've since dedicated myself to bringing the girl to justice and exposing whatever evil was being inflicted on her by her own flesh and blood, 
but real life isn't like films or books. And I'm not in any sort of position to be working a long-term job like that for free. I suppose I could try and maybe crowdfund it or something. I hear that's very popular these days. But I've learned over the years that there are some cases that you never get any answers from. The best thing you can do is just forget it and try and move on. After all, there's always another case, another mystery to obsess over. This is something that happened when I was a kid. I lived with my parents and my younger sister. At the time of the story, I was probably like 12 or 13. The neighborhood that we lived in had a little bit more land. The backyards of all the houses were kind of large, but the houses were still fairly close to each other. I knew a few of the neighbors, but didn't know any of them very well. There was one house sort of close to us that was next door to the west. Both our house and theirs had decks in the back, and the one next door was kind of small. I remember that I would go outside in the backyard a lot because I was a kid. I would practice playing sports back there and things like that. One time, I remember that I went outside and I saw the woman who lived next door out on her deck. She was pretty far away and it was kind of hard to see. It looked like she had binoculars and was looking right at me with them, though, and this seemed a little bit strange. I think it was just her and her husband who lived next door. They didn't seem to go outside much, and we rarely saw them. They also didn't seem to be very friendly. I know that every Halloween, we would go to their house, and they would never answer the door. I ignored what appeared to be her looking at me and kept doing what I was doing. I think I was practicing some frisbee golf shots or something like that. I looked up again a while later and she was still there facing me with the binoculars it seemed so strange that I just stopped and stared at her to see if I was seeing correctly. She did not move, the woman was just steps from the door to go back inside. I went back to doing what I was doing and looked again a few minutes later, this time she was gone. I was glad to see that and I stayed outside for a while. Back then, I was outside basically every day. I'm not sure if it was the next day or a few days later, though, but I soon saw her again. This time I was in the backyard once more, but the woman was inside her house. She was at a window. And I don't know which room it was, but it was a window on her house on the second floor. It looked sort of out to our backyard. I'm not even sure how I saw it because it's kind of hard to see in, but I saw her again. She had binoculars on once more and appeared to be looking at me with them. Now, our backyard wasn't that interesting. I had no clue as to why she would be looking out into our backyard. If she was just watching me specifically. Then I found that very odd. I stopped and stared at her again. I wasn't necessarily mad or annoyed with her, but I was just confused. I wanted to know what she was doing and if she was looking at me. She stayed there staring at me and I stared at her. She barely moved at all. This went on for like a minute or two straight. Then finally, I saw her move out of the way from the window. I went back to playing out in the yard after that. Each time that this happened, I never told my parents or anybody about it. It didn't seem like that big of a deal. And by the time I would come inside, I would have usually forgotten all about it. But a while after this, maybe a week or so, I really don't know, I happened to be outside pretty late one night. It was maybe like 11 p.m. or something. It was summertime, so I would stay up later, and this also meant that it was nice outside. Now, 
people were using both of the bathrooms that we had in our house. I really had to go, and being a guy, when this happened, I would sometimes go out in the backyard even though it was really late at night. I went downstairs and then out the back door to the backyard. Then I was going to go behind this one tree that we had, but before I got a chance to even walk out to the tree, I saw something. I looked over and noticed the woman stepping out onto her deck. She then put the binoculars up to her face and appeared to look over at me. She was literally right outside of the door leading to their deck, this late at night, that was really odd. I just turned around and ran back inside, it creeped me out and I just waited to use the bathroom. After that, there was no way I was going to go back outside. Still, I forgot to tell anybody. I'm not really sure how I did, but I just did. So that night, I went to bed. My bedroom happened to be down in the basement. Our house was a split level with two bedrooms upstairs and two bedrooms downstairs. My bedroom was partly underground and had a window that looked outside. After going to bed, I fell asleep rather quickly, but at some point, I woke up. When I did, I just remembered that I could tell it was still the middle of the night. I heard a noise coming from my window, and I looked over. I was expecting to see nothing, maybe it was a bug flying against the window with it being summertime. But what I saw was the woman literally standing right outside of my window and looking in at me. It was the craziest sight I had ever seen. I'm pretty sure I rolled off my bed to the other side, away from the window and onto the carpet. Then I hid behind my bed, I didn't want to look back at the window. I stayed there for a while. And when I was finally able to look up again, she was gone. I went upstairs and told my parents about it, and the next day, my dad went over to confront them. Her husband answered the door and denied everything. He said that we were crazy, and the husband was really mad about the accusation. My dad ended up cursing him out and then leaving. The woman never even came to the door. But after that confrontation, she never did anything strange like that again. I did see her a couple of times, but she wasn't doing anything weird when I did. Those people moved away like a year later, and a new family moved in. I still think about how bizarre that situation was though. Sometimes this is something that happened in the last apartment that I lived in. I moved into it in June of 2021 and lived there for two years before moving. After I'd lived there for about a year, I had a new neighbor move in next door. For some details on the apartment building, it's relatively new and was built, I believe, less than 10 years ago. I lived on the second floor and was the right before last unit on one end of it. The building has just straight hallways with units on both sides. My apartment had one bedroom, one and one half bathrooms, a living room, and a kitchen. The new neighbor next door got the very last unit on the end. In my time living there, most of the other neighbors were very friendly. I got to know almost everyone who lived on my floor. The person who previously lived next to me was very nice, and we would talk sometimes. A man moved in who didn't seem to be quite as friendly. I just talked to him once, shortly after he moved in. I didn't really see him much after that at all though, maybe like once or twice, but I can't specifically think of a time that I did. Probably like six months after the new neighbor guy moved in next door, I was up sort of late one night. I heard some pounding on the wall coming from his side. It wasn't that loud because the walls seemed to do well with holding sound, but I did hear it. I figured maybe he was hanging something on the wall and didn't pay it much thought. However, probably the next night, I was actually woken up hearing it again. 
It was a little bit louder this time, but I'm also a light sleeper. I tried to just go back to bed, and eventually, I did. The very next night though, I was woken up again, this time in the middle of the night. I woke up to some sounds coming from my bathroom area. The bathroom is connected to my bedroom, and the door leading to it was mostly closed. All of the lights were out, so when I looked around, I couldn't see anything. I was sitting up in bed, trying to figure out what it was that I was hearing. I was also a little bit confused from having just woken up, but then I realized what I was hearing. Somebody was in my bathroom. How they got in, I had no clue. I was sure that I had locked my doors. Then I started to hear footsteps. I jumped up from my bed and only grabbed my phone. Then, on the way out, grabbed my keys and ran completely out of my apartment. I kept running down the hallway and went down the stairs. When I had made it all the way out to my car, I called my best friend. Thankfully, she was actually still awake, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. She let me come over and stay at her place for the rest of the night. The next day, we went back to my place. We carefully looked around, and I was expecting the worst. I thought maybe it would be all messed up and a bunch of my items stolen, but surprisingly everything appeared to be in place. Nobody was inside the apartment at all. And nothing was stolen. I was so confused because I was sure that I had hurt somebody in there the night before. My friend asked me about everything that happened. As I was telling her, I walked into my bathroom to where I heard the noise. I am sending an actual picture of my bathroom so that you can see and get an idea as to what it looked like to describe where I heard the sounds. I realized it was near my shower, next to my shower. To the right is a very large storage cabinet or maybe you would even call it a closet. I didn't use it much at all, I just stored extra towels and blankets in there. That's kind of where I heard the noises, and I opened it up. When I did, I saw that some things in there were actually a little bit out of place. Then I moved a towel and saw that the wall had a significant crack in it. At least that's what I thought it was. I hadn't remembered it looking at all like that before. On the other side of the wall was my neighbor, the new guy. That's when I realized that he might have been the one in my apartment. I moved the crack a little and realized that a big chunk of the wall could be removed. Horrified. I moved away from there, and my friend and I left. We called the police and apartment management, they did an investigation, and the guy later admitted to creating a hole in the wall and entering my place. He never said what his intentions were, though. I'm glad that I didn't have to deal with him for the last few months that I lived there. But I ended up moving when my lease was up. I just couldn't live there anymore after what had happened. I'm also really glad that I heard the sound when I did and was able to leave my apartment so fast. I dog sit for a family friend. They much prefer to have someone stay at the house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere, and I love the countryside, so for me, this is like a station cause I live in the city now. Never really have any time to myself, so anyway, their house is literally in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean it takes two hours to get to and from my work, and it's about 45 minutes to the nearest town or interstate. There's only one neighbor within five miles, and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this from where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need, but also make you feel safer knowing you have at least one person nearby. However, this guy has done nothing but make me feel unsafe the whole time. So, 
I get to Terry and Johnny's house, and they're telling me the whole drill, when to feed the dogs, water the plants, etc. Then, as they're loading up their stuff to take into the car, Terry says, Oh, don't forget to tell her about Steve. John says, Oh yeah, uh, don't worry about the neighbor across the street, he's harmless. The guy drinks a lot and is a little bit off. But totally harmless. Hell, the guy has lost his license so many times, all he can do is drive a moped to get to town. He chuckles and then stops smiling. However, just in case, this is where we keep the gun. He then takes me to his gun, explains it's already loaded, and if I were to use it, I don't need to, just pull the trigger extra hard. At this point, I'm like, whatever. You keep a gun in your house when it takes police at least 45 minutes to get to your home? Still, I've got no worries. I'm used to drunk weirdos. I know how to handle them. I love this life in the middle of nowhere, and I've got two protective dogs that will attack on a one-word command, so I'm feeling pretty safe. Terry and Johnny leave around 3 p.m. I took the dogs for a walk, played some frisbee, and began unloading my stuff while they were still worn out from all the running. As I come back out to grab the second load of stuff, I hear their neighbor Steve slam his door and seemingly have a phone conversation. I just hear his voice faintly, and then he yells, Where'd you go? The dogs are probably hearing now and starting to crawl softly. I tell them, calm down, boys, it's all right, it's just Steve, remember? Probably just want some privacy. Let's go inside. As I grab my stuff, I hear him yell again, and I do care about my kids, you. And then I hear him throw something onto the unpaved road behind me. It turned out to be a cell phone. As I'm grabbing my other things, the dogs start going crazy and run a few feet behind me, barking and growling viciously. I drop my stuff and turned around to see a neighbor at the end of the driveway, probably 50 to 75 feet, just staring at me. I yell at the dogs to calm down, to get back inside, they do. I give a friendly wave to Steve. In my head, I'm thinking, this is kind of weird, but he's probably been drinking, plus they said the guy is harmless, right? And I've dog sat before and never had a problem with any neighbors. He then takes a single step forward and says in this weird sounding voice, you all right? Steve is wearing dirty jeans, work boots, a dirty red hoodie, and a red hat with a Confederate flag on it. He's also got dirty brown hair to his shoulders and a beard that's probably five inches long. Yeah, I'm pretty good. My name is P.I.P. I'm just dog sitting for Terry and Johnny this week and ready to get in and call it an evening with the boys. I look down at the dogs to see their reaction. They look like they're about to attack and I've never seen them act like this before. How about yourself? We sat in silence for almost 30 seconds before he said, I'm asking if you're all right. I'm Steve. Nice to meet you. Steve, thanks for being a good neighbor and checking, but like I said, I'm good. Are you all right? Again, silence. Now this silence lasts for probably a whole minute. And I figure he's got to be wasted, so I just get inside with my stuff. I turn around and finish grabbing my stuff, and as I do, I hear him take one more step on the gravel driveway, dogs bark again. I turn around, and Steve says, I know them dogs won't do nothing to me. They are some damn good dogs, that's for sure. I began feeling super uneasy, so I close my trunk and turn around to see if he's going to say anything else. 
I was about to tell him that I was going inside and then instead awkwardly say, Yeah, I'm, he cut me off. Yeah, what? He yelled. I'm shocked and say, Yeah, I'm going inside now. Thanks again for checking. Steve. I'm fine. I got the dogs this week. Have a good night. I turn and go, and the dogs follow me with no problem. Steve continues to stand right where I left him for literally 10 minutes, staring at the house. Now, it's a note, this house does not have a front door, there is a side door and a back door. The back door is the main door because the front of the house has those big green fluffy privacy trees so you can't even see his house through the front window. You can't see either door from the street, you have to come onto the property to see them. It's now about 6 o'clock, and where I'm at. The sun starts going down around then, but doesn't actually get dark until around 9.15 during the summer. So anyway, the dogs and I are on the couch, I've got my gaming headphones on while playing Red Dead Redemption 2. All of a sudden, the dogs flip there out of nowhere, running towards the back door, barking and growling. So I'm like, what the? They don't do that unless someone pulls up in their car and they don't know who it is. I'm not having anyone over. I grab my knife, which is always close by, and start walking toward the back door. The dogs are still going crazy. I have no idea what they're looking at, but then I look closer. I see moped tail lights in the driveway, seemingly hiding behind my car. I then try and focus in and see that Steve is turned around and staring at the back of the house from his moped, ducking behind my car. I get the dogs to be quiet, I hide to see what he's doing, dogs are still growling but at least they're not giving away my location. I stand there and watch him for five minutes, no movement. Just a creepy stare in my general direction. I don't think that he can see me, but I'm not sure. He then shuts off his moped and crouches next to my car. Now I can see him peeking into my car windows. I don't see him actually try to get into it, but he walks around it a few times He's not crouching anymore, obviously he feels like no one is watching him or even gives a that he's looking into my car. But he's only taking a single step at a time. It's creepy. At this point, I text Terry and tell her that Steve is doing some weird stuff. I tell her I'm starting to feel very uncomfortable. I get a text back reading, call the cops if you feel unsafe, they know him they can come talk to him. Remind me to tell you about the time he was standing out by the tree at 6 a.m. when I was leaving for work. When we get back, we think he had a psychotic break. Real comforting. So, I talk myself down some again. This guy has to be just wasted. However, if he starts getting close to the door, I'm definitely calling the cops dumb idea looking back now because the cops take so long to get out there. I'm still watching him as he's made his second round looking into my car. He then gets on his moped and drives off. As he passes the window that faces the driveway, he speeds up, trying to make it so I wouldn't see him if I were just watching TV. Fast forward, now it's like 8 p.m. The dogs start going crazy again, I look out, and now his moped is parked in plain view. He's standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. I had previously turned off all the lights so that he couldn't easily see in and see what I was doing. I see him take a single step towards the door now 29 feet away. I grab the gun calmed the dogs down, and they were in full unprotective mode. One dog to my left and one to my right. It's now 8.15pm, I called the cops, 
I explained the situation and that the owners think he had some kind of psychotic break. As I'm halfway through explaining why I'm starting to fear for my safety, the operator says, Ma'am, what is your address again? I tell her, Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you're not located in our county. We'll have to transfer you to the next one. Are you serious? The owner said that the cops in the South County know him very well and know how to handle him. Isn't that you guys? Yes, ma'am, that is us, but you're located in a different county, that's not our jurisdiction. The guy who is bothering me lives in your county, that's why I'm calling you. Operator then transfers me to another county. When she answers the phone with, average 911, what's your emergency? I'm silent. I'm looking out the kitchen window. Steve has come up another 45 feet since the last. I looked out. 911, what's your emergency? I then explain what's happening. I explained that I was transferred because apparently I'm not in their jurisdiction. She tells me to remain calm, turn on all the lights, and I said that this guy is waiting for me to do something like that. The doors are locked, and I do have a firearm. If he enters, I will shoot. She then tells me that it's safest with the lights on. I turn on the lights, he notices, turns, and gets on his moped and drives back to his house. I tell her what's happened, she asks if I would still like an officer to come out. Hell yeah, I want an officer to come out. Apparently, the cops in the South County know him, but she transferred me to you. This is the third time he's come onto the property. He's getting closer and closer to the door. I do not feel safe. Someone that is not me needs to talk to this guy. Calm down, ma'am. We will still send someone. However, based on where you're located, it will take a while for one to get out there. That's fine. I just want someone out here. Thank you. I asked her if she would stay on the line until he got here or no she said that one's on its way out but she needs to be available if anyone else calls in. She told me if he came back and I was still uneasy to call them without hesitation. Now it's getting around 9 p.m. The sun is getting ready to completely set again and the dogs go crazy. Now I'm getting really pissed off. I'm walking around the house with a loaded gun so that if Steve sees me, he sees that gun too. I look out the window and see his head, but I don't see him. What? Where is he from the window in the kitchen? I can't see the back door. So I go upstairs. One dog follows. The other is too old to climb stairs. And I go peek down through the bathroom window. Steve's on the back porch, lighting matches and throwing them down onto the wooden porch. He doesn't seem harmless anymore. He's talking to himself, twisting his head back and forth like he's getting warmed up to fight or having a conversation with another one of his personalities or something. I started filming him from the upstairs window just in case I died. You know, so that I could hide my phone, and when they found it, they knew it had to be this guy. The sun is down, and it's starting to get dark. He steps up to the door and starts knocking. He then starts pounding on the door. I'm pretty good at staying calm in situations, but my heart starts beating so fast that my Fitbit had to change my heart rate tap every two seconds. If he gets in here, I'm going to have to kill this guy, or he's going to kill me. I could see pure hatred in this guy's eyes. He then stopped pounding at the door, quickly turned away, ran back to his moped, started it, and took off faster than I thought a moped could even go. Not even a minute later, the cop pulled into the driveway, 
I'd mention to the dispatch operator that I do have two dogs who would bark at the officer, but would not attack unless given a specific word. They are trained, and I do have a firearm. I'll leave the firearm inside when I go to meet the officer. I met the officer, the dogs didn't crawl, simply gave a single bark apiece to let me know that someone was there. I went outside to meet him and told him that the guy just took off on a moped, he said, oh yeah, I think I just passed him when I turned onto the road. I explained that he was absolutely drunk or crazy, and if he saw him on his way back, he should definitely pull him over because I'm quite positive he's definitely under the influence of something, normal people just don't act that way. The cop basically shrugs everything off and says, Well, are you going to stay the night here? I told him no, I'll leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I asked him to stay while I packed everything up, and he nodded. I go inside and give the dogs love and treats and crate them for the night. I take off and return the next day with my father. My dad starts to walk the perimeter of the property trying to show Steve that there is also a man staying there. Now I'm a 24-year-old female, if you're wondering. Then Steve, wearing that same dirty outfit and hat while holding a 24 case of Budweiser, is just standing at the end of the driveway again. I'm watching him from the front window. I see my dad at the other end of the yard as he comes into view. Steve turns around and walks back into his house. I later learned that Steve had been to jail multiple times due to domestic abuse. His kids were not allowed to see him due to his violent nature. And he bought a four-wheeler, no one knows how he gets the money to get these things. Terry and Johnny have never seen him leave for work. They've only seen him leave on his moped or four-wheeler, then an hour or two later, return with a case or two of beer. I don't know who he thought I was but every time he looked at the house in my direction.